Well, hello there. How is everyone? I hope you are all well, you amazing, amazing, beautiful, wonderful people. And guess what? Yeah, that's it, baby. Here's the midweek hump. We all love a midweek hump. Mm. And what are we doing in this video here? By the way, you're looking absolutely amazing. And, and I know what it's attributed to, the fact that it is the midweek hump. And it always makes everyone get a glow on their faces. Anyway, this video I'm doing because a lot of you have reached out to me. Crazy! You, crazy. you just can't wait. You can't wait. It needed to be done need to be done and, and that is to go over Jay Ombre's video so in the link of the dis there is no in the description of this video there is a link and that will take you to Jay Ombre's video which is this one which we're going to be going over in this video here um, he did the work he did it he deserves the any accolades that come from it all right but you've asked me to go over it, so I will go over it. And then later on today, I'll just do a shrunk down version just to conclude, to summarize. And there we go. Okay, just for those people who like a shorter video. And with that, I better get on with it because this is becoming quite a long intro. So this is The Moscow Murders by Pavarotti. So we have a listen. Now, this all starts back with the Quad Cities Drug Task Force. It was the mission, let's see, mission statement. Mission of this task force is to operate an enhanced multi-jurisdictional task force to combat controlled substance offenses and prevent trafficking of these substances in the Quad Cities of Lewiston, Clarkston, Moscow, and Pullman. Member agencies work together and share information to identify those involved. So we know that there's a big, a big issue around these areas, and they are indeed. And he will go on to show some of the arrests and some of the things that happen. But those of you who have been following the Idaho 4 case and the things that have happened around the area, around the times that these crimes happened, we know that there were some big arrests in the area. But this is just saying, look, there was an issue. They set up a task force and that was being investigated and work was being done to brought that bring that down. So here we go. In the distribution, sale, manufacture, and possession of controlled substances in order to develop prosecutable cases against them. Now, who does the drug task force consist of? Again, it's various prosecutorial entities, such as the prosecutors in the different counties, the judges. It also included state and local law enforcement as well as federal. This is where the FBI came into play, folks, and they're still there. They're still investigating. Which has always been an interesting question. It, it, it's interesting. I, I believe, um, what's her name? Andrea Burkhart brought this up as well. It was, it, was, it was about the FBI's involvement in this case and the fact that this case, only certain things would put this case into the realms of where FBI would have continued involvement. And at the moment, we don't know. And we've also got to take into consideration that this has been noted as being a very complex case. And to be honest, if it's Brian Koberger who did the crime, and it was as simple as his car was seen, it can be proven that he, he was seen in the area. And not only that, but he left a knife sheath at the scene of the crime with his DNA on it. Then that's not overly complex, is it? That is kind of what you would class as a, a slam dunk. There might be some other stuff in the background, but ultimately that's pretty much all you really, in some some... Some people would say that's all you need. There's certainly that's all that a lot of people need in the community to have this guy pinned to the wall already. But they've stated it's complex, and the FBI is in, in, you know, their involvement in this has raised a few questions. And does is this where this now does start to indeed make sense? But also, the state police, local Moscow and Pullman police officers are all part of the task force. Now, what is their modus operandi? What are they looking for? They're looking for people who have been arrested on minor drug charges who they can then turn into informants and work their way up the chain trying to nab the big fish, the big drug trafficking organizations. And they did that in this case. March of 2023, they took down 
The big drug trafficking organization, which is a drug ring that was tied to the Aryan prison gang, who was who indicted uh, 24 federal arrests. It's up to 28 now, folks. So, yeah, look, so this Aryan prison gang was indicted with 24 federal arrests. So a big, 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 big arrest. And when you look at these numbers on the screen here, more than 1.9 million doses of fent and then 230 pounds of meth. That's a massive, massive seizure. I'm not going to go through it while he reads everything, but let's um, jump forward. We're going to really get into that in this one. Now, this is how the operation worked prior to everything going sideways there in November, or excuse me, really September of 2022. You can see over in Seattle in Tacoma, that's where the headquarters of the Aryan Circle were. They were distributing, many, or excuse me, they were trafficking large amounts of narcotics two different areas of Washington. Well, you can go through, they even up to as far as Alaska. I mean, this was a big one. But we're going to focus in on our story here because our story is in Moscow, Idaho. So, but you can see the Aryan Circle up in Seattle and Tacoma would traffic. The and what I will just say here, just to interject, so obviously we've got the Aryan Circle here, their headquarters, and they're obviously shipping stuff across into these areas. You've got Cordelline there, and their police station has just burnt down, I've, I've, I've been, <laughs> been notified of. So someone obviously had a problem, or someone was perhaps cooking a hot pocket and that got out of hand. Who knows? But, yeah, that's just burnt down. <laughs> but it is interesting. It is interesting so far. Narcotics across Highway, excuse me, Interstate 90, all the way up into Spokane, Washington. And that's where another group of the Aryan Circle would pick it up. And those are the Aryan Knights. The Aryan Knights are very prominent in Idaho and also in eastern Washington. Now, when everything was trafficked over to Spokane, then we've got to get it down to Moscow, to our little neck of the woods in this case. How did we do that? Well, they would have mules from the city of Coeur d'Alene, which you can see is right next to Spokane. Those mules would pick up the narcotics in Spokane and then drive them down State Highway 95 all the way into Moscow. And then they would deliver them to our friends TF and TR there in Moscow. That's where they lived. They would then distribute those, those things to their local dealers, excuse me, their local, yeah, their local dealers. Their local dealers would then take them from TF and TR, and then they would go to those. And I don't know whether he's going to go into talking about this, but what we, what we have to, with respect of Moscow, Idaho, we have to check out and, and really think about the dynamic here, because this is obviously what is happening. We know that there are, these issues exist. We know it exists. We can't ignore it. But we have to factor in the dynamic of the town, the fact that they are very, very student heavy. Now, it's not going to just be the students who are going to be the customers, if you like, because we know that there's been some multiple arrests around this area and and, and a lot of them have not been students. But in order to make this a viable business, and to make risk versus reward, they're going to have to chomp into that that student that that you know that network, if you like. They're going to have to get them into that. And when you think about some of the things that are happening on the peripheral of our victims, such as with Zana Canodal especially, and those sort of things, and the locks being changed on the doors, you have to consider. Was there indeed something bubbling around that they were aware of? And I also have to, at this point as well, factor in that Kaylee Gonsalves, for instance, it was noted that she was a bit of a sleuth herself. And was Kaylee Gonsalves perhaps seeing what was happening or had heard what was happening or, or had cottoned on to what was going on in this area and had she got up on someone's radar? But let's go on. Colleges there in Moscow and Pullman and distribute it to the youth. Now, with two major colleges and that being the major source for all of the narcotics in the area, I imagine that was a very profitable route. That you 
so yeah, he obviously touches on the fact that they've he's, they've got to start getting into that network. Like I said, my only concern here would be we don't currently have any definitive proof that a mass mass market percentage was taken up by the university, and and they do have people outside of that network as well. So yes, I do believe that they would have to be selling into the students. Yeah, I, I do. I I believe that that's got to be accurate because I think that that's the only way to make the risk worse versus reward. Yeah, viable, viable. But could they have leveraged some of the kids to then branch out? Does this? It's it's like a tree, isn't it? You've got the people shipping over from Seattle into Spokane, then they're coming down into the the dealers in Moscow, then the dealers are selling, and before you know it. If you've got some smart ass kids that then think, hold on a second, we can buy it for this and we can actually distribute it ourselves. And it's almost like they then become their own little hub. Let's, it'll be interesting to see whether um, Pavarotti states that himself here as well. Being on the screen here. Now, we've identified through arrest and public record everything on the screen right here. We've got the over 20 of the folks in the Aryan Drug Trafficking Organization that was arrested in March of 2023. That's, that's the major group. We've got our two mules that were arrested, both muling drugs, who were from Coeur d'Alene. They were both arrested muling the drugs from Spokane down to Moscow. Then we've got our distributors that were arrested right there in Moscow with very high quantities of the drugs. And then we've got our dealers that are admitted dealers right there in Moscow that would deal the drugs to the youth. So obviously this is when you start seeing the elements of the Idaho 4 case trickle in and become entwined in this situation. And you've obviously seen the likes of Demetrius and Emma seemingly walking free from literally supplying a fraternity member narcotics and losing his life and, and and walking free from it and then you've obviously got what he's listed here as being users yeah you, you know we've obviously we know that Brent Kopak was going through his difficulties and was he trying to to cope with that using narcotics he obviously in the in the recent um, body cam footage we see he, he's, he's lost a lot of weight he's not looking great and we've also got brian koberger who if you believe some of the things that were said about him with his behaviors at, at college is it is it a possibility then at the bottom we've got the two outliers we've got mr bk number one and we've got the other one who's probably not even his real picture um that's just come to light but still we're going to call that bk number two and I'm, I'm going to start really pushing the fact that these two were just simple users. It's but let's possible. continue. When we look at the history, we've got the Quad Cities Drug Task Force is in operation, and then something happens August 21st of 2021. We've got Ms. Cronova was arrested muling drugs. She was arrested for possession of a controlled substance with intent to deliver and possession of a controlled substance. And then in June of 2022, we have Miss Hatrock, who was also arrested muling drugs, possession of a controlled substance with intent to deliver, possession of a controlled substance, and possession of drug paraphernalia. Now, they're both in the system. Who is going to go straight for them? Because they're trying to figure out how to get to the upper ends of the drug trafficking organization at this point. Well, that's where the drug task force would absolutely... And again, I'm I'm sure that he's going. Uh, I would imagine he's going to go into this, but with respect of who we're looking at here on the screen, you have to consider if this is if if there's whispers in the air that there is potential for people to 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 speak, or they already have spoken. Do you know what I mean? Is 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 this a warning shot? Was this indeed a warning shot? And did that warning shot actually work? Did it work? And is that why they then went on and had to leverage on 
the likes of Emma Bailey and Demetrius Robinson. Who knows? But absolutely ascend on those two. Turning them into informants would lead to major arrests. And how are they able to put that kind of pressure? Folks, you got to understand when the task force is turning somebody into an informant, especially with charges like this, they're sitting down with them with their attorney, with the prosecutor, and they're all putting pressure on them, telling them things like your schedule two narcotic has a possible imprisonment of life imprisonment, $25,000 fine or both. That's the pressure they're putting on them. That's how they turn them into an informant. Did they turn them into informants? Is there any proof of that? Well, you can see right here, I've got the drug task force turns them into informants because here's the proof. Let's look at their actual sentences. You have to really dig deep to figure this out, folks. You can start over there with Miss Hatrock. You can see that it says she got three to four years in the penitentiary, right? That never happened. Look at her charges. I mean, look at her, look at her details right here. What kind of confinement did she have? You can see over there, Ms. Grenoble's confinement, it says state prison. No, not Ms. Hatrock, it says county jail. Kootenay County Public Safety Building for a discretionary term of 90 days. <laughs> that three to four years never happened. Look under. So there you go. So he's, he's absolutely right, isn't he? It, it, it would seem, yeah. That where it says penitentiary suspended and she got credit for time served. 90 days was her sentence, and she was out of that public safety building in Kootenai County. She was an informant, folks. There is no doubt. Now, let's look at Ms. Kernodal. She was uh, sentenced to state prison two to three years. But look, you can see it says retained jurisdiction for 365 days, and look at the condition at the bottom. That's not th two to three years in prison. Felony probation. That's felony probation for three years, starting 2224 two, two, to 621 of 23. Neither one of them got a second of prison time, folks. Those are informants. There's your proof. Now, let's look at what happens next because now we're getting into public record. On September 13th, it became public knowledge that Kernodal made a deal. All right, this one goes out to the drug trafficking organizations. Everybody knows it. And then the, ne the very next day, what happens? Well, we got TF and TR arrested on those very serious drug trafficking charges right there in Moscow. Over a pound of METH, 30 F pills. I mean, this was a big time bust. These are big time dealers. And we didn't realize how big time it was until we start digging into who they are. And you can see TF right here. He's identified through his response to a Facebook post where you see he says ACAB. At first, I thought that meant all cops are B-A-S-T-A-R-D-S, a slogan used by the white supremacists. But it turns out what that A-C-A-B is, that's him declaring Aryan that he is circle, Aryan Circle, Aryan brotherhood. Aryan brotherhood. Now it gets serious. They just informed on a member of the Aryan Circle. We've been lied to. This is the worst I've ever seen. It. Got an ad. This is a Stop place mine. where people are so angry, so frustrated. Skip. Now, their residence there in Moscow, you can see 815 North Cleveland Street, is as the crow flies, as they say, it's about a mile from the King Road residence right there in Moscow as well. Now, what happened to them? You can see from a news release on December 2nd that on October 21st, that TF was actually released from custody <laughs> on a furlough by Magistrate Judge Megan Marshall. I think he accepted And he'd he never returned on that furlough, and the warrant was issued for his arrest. He was picked up December 2nd in Spokane, up there where the Aryan Knights are located. So, where was he at between October 21st and December 2nd? Those are some important times, aren't there? Then on November 11th, we got Miss Hatrock's court date finally came due, and now it's public knowledge that everybody knows she made a deal as well. So they had a major Aryan Circle distributor arrested in Moscow, and within days of that, we have the two mules that worked for them turned evidence and it became public knowledge of their plea deals. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, but you've...
this is kind of undeniable that there are risks involved here. That's when you are talking about this size of operation and these people involved and the the, the potential and it it looks one hundred percent looks like that at least two people with direct connections into the Idaho Four tragedy were indeed turned state witnesses. And if that was the case, then yeah, you can't you can't ignore this. You can't you can't ignore it. Is there definitive proof that it was connected? No, it's not. But it's absolute evidence when you pull anything else from a side as well, like the FBI involvement and potential use of stingrays, and and things start filtering in now. Is there a crossover somewhere? Is there? Did it just happen that Brian Koberger, if he's if he had nothing to do with this, did he just step into something that sadly got him caught because he was unaware of an even bigger operation going on that included that property? That's obviously something that has to be considered as well. Or was Brian Koberger not just a user, but was he something to do with this? It's all but over at this point. When we look at the timeline and you see how it lays out, it's almost shocking. We got the Quad City Drugs Task Force in operation. Kernodal and Hat Rocker arrested. The task force gets with them, turns them. On September 13th, her plea deal becomes public knowledge. September 14th, TF and TR are arrested. They set them up. October 21st, they're released from Latile County Jail, one on bind, the other one on furlough. And then on the 11th, Hat Rock's deal becomes public knowledge. What happened? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave it there. Because, again, this is, this is Jay Ombre's video. And I think if you want to find out where this goes, then the link is in the description. Go and find out how this progresses and um, where this ends up. Because I think this is an absolute pinnacle piece here where you consider the... The canodal on the hat rock, you know, arrests for for the trafficking, and then all of a sudden you've got things that then start to happen and become public knowledge, and then you've got two of the main people involved. You know, you're talking about the distributor, the, you know, the the t towards the top of the food chain now, and look at this date. The 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 plea deal acceptance on there, which is November the eleventh. We know what happens just a few days later. And um, I must admit, do you know what I mean? It's, it's something that we've considered, it's something that we've spoken about, and it's things that we've toyed with, or we've spoken about the Frat Brothers and whether that theory holds any weight. We're, we've, we've looked into narcotics, and we've even at some stage, we've... I think we've pansy pussyfooted around it a bit because it's a it's a difficult one when you're talking about these these families and the potential that the actions of the parents had reverberations that affected their kids. But when it's written out like this, it really does look like that's a possibility. But anyway, like I say, link in description to go and finish that video if you want to see more, if you haven't watched it already. But my thoughts are, yeah, this very much looks like it's a possibility that yeah, this was a narcotics-related incident and potentially, um, yeah, um, payback. Let me know down below what you think, and I'll catch you all in the next one.